haben ein zweites kleines Problem, dass unsere Rednerin noch irgendwo zwischen dem Frankfurter Flughafen und hier ist. Aber wir sind gewappnet, das hat uns schon die ganze Zeit Sorge gemacht, dass Frau Toy heute das sehr, sehr eng terminiert hat. Wir waren aber guter Hoffnung, aber die Lufthansa war nicht mit uns. Das ist ein bisschen blöd. Sie wird aber wahrscheinlich irgendwann innerhalb der nächsten zehn Minuten durch die Tür reinfallen. Das heißt, wir fangen ganz normal mit Visions for Climate, zweite Veranstaltung der Ringvorlesung an. Und ich fange erst jetzt nicht an, wie geplant, mit dem Curriculum von Frau Toy aus der Geowissenschaften, sondern versetzt, verschiebe das nach hinten. Wir fangen, wer letztes Woche da war, damit an, dass wir die Traumreise starten. Können wir das, Timo? Und dann in der Hoffnung, dass sie in der Zeit einfällt. Und wir bemühen uns heute um das nachhaltige Entwicklungsziel 12. Das ist glücklicherweise noch da. Und äh, es heißt Responsible Consumption and Production. Und wir werden die Traumreise auf Deutsch haben und danach den Vortrag auf Englisch haben, weil Frau Toy ja aus Neuseeland kommt. Gut, dann darf ich Timo bitten, die Traumreise zu starten. Hallo, auch diese Vorlesung werden wir gemeinsam beginnen. Wenn du mir also wieder eine Chance gibst, kann ich dich erneut auf eine spektakuläre Reise mitnehmen. Alles, was du tun musst, ist dein Handy beiseite zu legen, deine Notizen für einen Moment zu vergessen und es dir so gemütlich wie möglich zu machen. Und jetzt schließe deine Augen. Ganz genau, mach deine Augen jetzt zu. Sitzt du entspannt mit geschlossenen Augen auf deinem Platz? Sehr gut. In der letzten Woche hast du erfahren, dass der Platz, auf dem du gerade sitzt, in Wahrheit eine Zeitmaschine ist, die dich an jeden Zeitpunkt in der Geschichte des Universums führen kann. Wir haben uns entschieden, einen Blick auf die nahe Zukunft zu werfen, auf das Jahr 2100. Von allen möglichen Zukünften haben wir eine ausgewählt, in der die Menschheit Anfang der 2020er Jahre global den Ernst der Klimakrise begriffen und dementsprechend gehandelt hat. Eine Zukunft, in der die Erde seit 2037 klimaneutral ist und auf der die 1,5-Grad-Grenze sowie wichtige Kippelemente im Klimasystem nicht überschritten wurden. Die Menschen in dieser möglichen Zukunft leben nachhaltig, im Frieden miteinander und im Einklang mit einer einigermaßen intakten Umwelt. Manche von ihnen studieren und forschen am Nachhaltigkeitsinstitut der Uni Mainz. Und genau dort zieht es dich wieder hin. Denn du hast noch eine Einladung von einer jungen Wissenschaftlerin offen. Also los geht's. Erneut scheint die Welt an dir vorbeizurauschen. Diese Fahrt ist ein wenig wilder als die letzte. Du siehst riesige Maschinen, Wolkenkratzer und Vorstädte. Plötzlich bist du unter der Erde und dann auf einem Feld, dann in einem Wohnzimmer, dann mitten im Ozean und dann wieder zurück. Im Moment zwischen zwei Herzschlägen ist die Reise schon geschehen und auf einmal bist du da. Oder doch nicht? Das Gebäude vor dir ist definitiv nicht das Nachhaltigkeitsinstitut, das du letzte Woche besucht hast. Es sieht eher aus wie eine Industriehalle mit einer riesigen Maschine und Fließbändern darin. Während du dich noch orientierst, hörst du eine bekannte Stimme. Ah, da bist du ja. Schön, dass du wiedergekommen bist. Tut mir leid wegen des unerwarteten Landeplatzes. Ich dachte mir, was ist denn der Sinn einer Zeitreise, wenn man nicht auch ein paar neue Orte kennenlernt? Deshalb habe ich einige Koordinaten an deinen Raumzeitnavigator geschickt, um dich bei deinen nächsten Besuchen noch besser herumführen zu können. Willkommen bei Recycle Mainz. Keine Sorge, Recyclinganlagen sind nicht die einzige Freizeitattraktion in der Zukunft, aber ich persönlich finde, dass dieser Ort gerade für jemanden wie dich wie ein kleines Wunder wirken muss. Komm, wir sehen uns um. Ihr beginnt ein wenig über das riesige Gelände zu spazieren. Vorbei an zahllosen Haufen fein getrennter Materialien, Bauschutt, Holz, Plastik, etwas, das vielleicht die Fernseher der Zukunft sind. Glas, Papier und vieles mehr. Weißt du, zu deiner Zeit haben wir gerade einmal 16% unserer Rohstoffe recycelt und das noch nicht mal gleichmäßig über den Planeten hinweg. Es gab Orte und Menschen, 
die regelrecht in den Müll, den andere verursacht haben, ertrunken sind. Aber zum Glück hat die Politik in den 2020ern erkannt, wie absurd diese Situation ist. Und umfangreiche politische Maßnahmen und Verbote wurden auf den Weg gebracht. Deswegen haben wir heute eine Recyclingquote von über 99 Prozent, was uns eine unvermüllte Natur und gesunde Menschen zurückgebracht hat. Unsere automatisierten Rohstoffsortierungsanlagen können jedes Objekt in seine Grundstoffe zerteilen und diese wieder aufbereiten, sodass Kunststoffe, Metalle, seltene Erden, chemische Grundstoffe und vieles mehr wieder zur Verfügung stehen, um etwas Neues daraus zu machen. Parallel zum Recycling sind wir in vielen Bereichen auch einfach auf nachwachsende Alternativen umgestiegen, was unseren weltweiten Bedarf an nicht erneuerbaren Ressourcen um nahezu 80 Prozent gesenkt hat. Die Kreislaufwirtschaft, die wir uns so über die Jahrzehnte hinweg seit deiner Zeit aufgebaut haben, kennt den Begriff Müll gar nicht mehr. Genauso wenig wie Rohstoffmangel oder Abhängigkeit. Unsere Müllhalden sind keine Endstationen, sie sind Schnellzugstrecken, hinein in einen neuen Sinn für alles Alte. Sorry, falls da jetzt die Begeisterung mit mir durchgegangen ist. Was ist noch spannend? Hm. Diese Recyclinganlage vor dir wird zum Beispiel mit Energie aus Geothermie, also Erdwärme, betrieben. Was hier in der Region Mainz eine gute Ergänzung zu Wind und Sonne ist. Besonders praktisch an der Geothermie ist, dass man damit nicht nur Strom erzeugen kann, sondern auch ganz einfach und günstig Wohnungen und Betriebe heizen kann. Solche Nah- und Fernwärmenetze gab es schon zu deiner Zeit. Seit den 20ern haben wir sie stark ausgebaut und angefangen, sie mit klimaneutralen Methoden zu betreiben. Wo Geothermie nicht genutzt werden kann, greifen wir beispielsweise auf die Abwärme der Industrie oder großer Rechenzentren zurück. Aber ich verliere mich schon wieder im nächsten Thema. Dieses Mal will ich dich losschicken, bevor deine Zeitmaschine Alarm schlägt. Bis bald! Ich freue mich schon darauf, dir noch viel mehr zu zeigen. Du gehst zurück in deine Zeitmaschine und in die Gegenwart. Augen auf! So, wir waren ja jetzt guter Hoffnung, dass Virginia Toy genau in diesen zehn Minuten einläuft. Wir sind vorbereitet für den Fall mit einer Aufzeichnung ihrer Präsentation. Das wird also sehr lustig. Sie wird dann mitten in ihre eigene Präsentation reinschneiden. Und da es ja keinen Sinn macht, dass ich sie dann mittendrin nochmal vorstelle, darf ich Ihnen jetzt Frau Toy, obwohl sie nicht da ist, vorstellen. Frau Toy hat einen sehr interessanten Lebenslauf. Sie ist in Neuseeland geboren, in Oakland genau, und hat auch in Oakland studiert, und zwar Geowissenschaften, und hat dann einen Abschluss gemacht an der University of Otago, wo sie auch, wo sie promoviert hat in Geology, also Geologie und nicht Geografie, und hat vorher aber einen ein Master an der Austin National University in Oakland abgelegt. Sie ist dann von dort gegangen, von der Nordinsel auf die Südinsel, wer sich ein bisschen mit Neuseeland auskennt, und dann ist an die University of Otago gegangen, ist eine extrem renovierte Universität in Daniden und war da dann Research Associate Professor im Jahre 2018 bis 2019, war dann Dekan und ist dann seit 2019, also seit gut drei Jahren, übergelaufen von der ganzen Südhalbkugel auf die Nordhalbkugel und ist bei uns im Geowissenschaftlichen Institut aktiv. Sie hat in den Jahren einige Preise eingefahren, zum Beispiel eine Alexander von Humboldt von Deutschen Scout und sie hat eine ganze Kollektion von wissenschaftlichen Papern geschrieben und ist eine sehr große Aktivistin, als wir uns im Vorfeld unterhalten haben, hat sie auch erzählt, dass sie die Strecke auch schon mal mit einem Containerschiff gefahren ist, um nicht fliegen zu müssen. Das ist also schon sehr großes Engagement, das dauert dreieinhalb Wochen. Gut, dann freuen wir uns, wenn sie jetzt mitten in ihren eigenen Vortrag irgendwann reinplatzt, was wir hoffen. Und Timo, wie sieht's aus? Abschuss. Good morning, everyone. Oops, start again. Hello, Timo. Thanks for the intro. Um, my name is Virginia Toy, and it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce a geological perspective um, into this interdisciplinary lecture series on visions for climate. So, 
Um, the title of my lecture is How Can We Make Best Use of Earth's Natural Resources to Fight the Energy Crisis? Um, and I think that this is a particularly topical issue for us at present. The lecture in general, um, I'm going to cover three topics. So I, I want to talk to you about oil or um, what I would call hydrocarbon as um, a source of energy from the earth. I'd like to explain where we get oil from, how much of it there is, and, and um, how it's formed. Following that, I'd like to talk to you about the climatic implications of using oil. And at the end, I'd like to present you with some alternatives. What sorts of other sorts of energy could we use instead of oil that come from the earth? And how will we find those sources of energy? So first up, hydrocarbons or oil. Um, oil is just one type of hydrocarbon. Now, hydrocarbons are essentially molecules of hydrogen and carbon. Um, and the majority of the big hydrocarbon deposits that formed in the earth um, were formed by the same process. Basically, um, they represent dead organic material. Actually, all of us are potentially future oil reserves. Um, because there's a lot of carbon in the human body, right? Okay, so particularly in certain periods of Earth's history, but most over a series of millions of years in the past, but particularly in times like the Carboniferous, which was 400 million years ago, when global temperatures were different to how they were today, actually the whole of the globe had a lot more warm environments. Um, at that time, there was a lot of plant matter or actually mostly plankton that um, died and sank to the ocean floor. And then it was buried in the floor of the ocean um, in a mixture of fine mud and clay. Um, and there was a population of anaerobic bacteria that went into that mixture as well on the ocean floor. Um, and that, that mixture then becomes known as sapropyl. Yeah. Okay. What happens to the sapropyl then is you have the sludge of, of mud and clay and dead organic material and bacteria. And you see that more sediment is deposited on top of that. And as you pile more sediment on top of stuff on the ocean floor, you increase the pressure. So as stuff gets buried deeper because of the weight of the overlying material, the, the pressure there is higher. Um, and additionally, as you bury stuff into the earth, you get a gradual increase in temperature, which becomes important again later in this lecture. So this increase in pressure and temperature um, results in a conversion, a, a pr progressive compaction of the sapropyl, um, and also a conversion to a different form of hydrocarbon. Um, so what we see is at a burial depth of one to two kilometers, a temperature of 50 degrees C, the sapropyl is converted to something known as kerogen. Um, with progressively further burial to three to five kilometers, the kerogen is converted into liquid petroleum. And even more burial, five to seven kilometers, is um, conversion of the kerogen into natural gas. It's, it's the type of hydrocarbon that you form is critically dependent on the pressure and temperature conditions, in particular the temperature, and the rate at which the hydrocarbon, the original um, clay mud and mixture is basically um, how quickly the temperature increases, right? So, so not all dead organic material ever turns into oil and not all of it turns into liquid petroleum. Some of it turns into petroleum, some turns into natural gas. Um, an awful lot of material is buried in the earth in this way and forms these um, hydrocarbon molecules but not all of it then becomes available for us to use and extract. So if you can think about the sedimentary unit that, the, or the rock unit that this um, hydrocarbon's in, you guys might have heard of the idea of a hydrocarbon reservoir. What a hydrocarbon reservoir is, is actually a layer of usually a sandy material. Um, like, so this picture on the top right here is, is an agglomeration of sand grains. They're stuck together. Um, a little bit with usually a little bit of calcium carbonate. Um, but in between all of the grains of sand, there are spaces um, that are known as pores or porosity. And in those spaces, that's where the liquid like petroleum or natural gas is able to reside. And you want to um, 
basically as you generate gas through burial in layers of rock beneath the surface of the earth, um, you, what you want is to have some sort of reservoir rock like this that has sufficient pore space in it that all of that, those hydrocarbons can sit there. Um, the problem is that if you have a natural pathway to the surface from this layer, so if you just have this layer of sand that all the way through has got porosity in it, then as you generate hydrocarbons at a depth of three kilometers, they'll all rise up to the surface and squirt out and disappear and you won't trap them. So it's really important that you have different layers of rock, some of which are really porous, they have lots of porosity, sands, and then some other layers are, for example, clays and muds, and they're very low porosity. And if you have a layer of, um, we call it impermeable, so fluids won't flow through it, if you have a layer of impermeable stuff sitting on top of a sandy layer, then that traps all of the hydrocarbons and the pore space in the sand and they can't rise to the surface. And the process of finding hydrocarbons, a big part of it is to understand two things. One is the history of increase of pressure and temperature in a rock layer over its lifetime, so that you can try and calculate, is it likely that any organic material in here actually was converted to oil and gas? And then another part of the exploration for hydrocarbons is to try and make um, images of the subsurface to look at the, the way that the rock layers are arranged um, and to try and predict if there are places where the hydrocarbons will have migrated into what we call structural traps. It's basically, if you can think of um, a folded layer of rock um, with a, as shown in this diagram at the bottom of this slide, maybe you've got a folded layer of really permeable stuff and then you've got a folded layer of impermeable rock above it. And the idea is that at the top of that fold, all of the hydrocarbons generated throughout that sandy, that deeper layer, will flow upwards and just sit in that little um, top part of the fold, as you can see in this diagram here. And if you're lucky, you can locate one of these structural traps, and in order to extract the oil to the surface, you would drill a borehole from the surface down into that um, reservoir of oil and gas, and then the material will rise back to the surface. Now, just generally speaking, most of these um, reservoirs at depth are at depths of maybe four kilometers or more or less, but that's, that's sort of the range of depths at which you'd have to drill a borehole in order to tap some oil reserves and bring them to the surface. Okay, globally, there are places where there's more and less oil reserves. Um, this map shows um, in gradational color scale where you would find a lot of natural oil and gas. Um, and you can see that there are massive um, reserves in the American, the USA, and particularly in Canada. Um, there's also substantial reserves in the Middle East, um, particularly in Saudi Arabia and related countries. There are quite large reserves in um, Russia, and there's fairly um, large reserves in parts of South America, in particular Venezuela. Now, at the moment, these oil and gas and coal reserves provide approximately 85% of our global energy. You may be aware that our consumption of oil and gas has been dramatically increasing with time. Um, every year we use vast amounts more oil and gas than we did the preceding year. And just an interesting statistic that you'll see here is that the amount of coal, coal is also a hydrocarbon, by the way, it forms also by burial and addition of heat and temperature to organic material. Um, this year, the globe concern, um, consumed the same amount of coal as has ever been found in this region of Northeastern America, indicated by the red ellipse here. Um, just, just out of interest. Okay. So, now, oil, natural gas, coal, these are the most energy dense natural resource on planet Earth. And sometime in our preceding history, when we discovered the ability to run motor vehicles, to run heating, to run whatever on oil and natural gas, someone made a decision that it was a good idea that we exploit this particular energy resource to fuel the planet. 
And this has really had a dramatic consequence for us in terms of human evolution. Probably many of the things that we do today as human beings would have just been impossible without this really, really energy dense source from nature. Okay, pretty important point to realize. Now, I've put up a slide here. This is this, this character at the top right of this slide. Um, when I first started to study for my PhD, um, which was in 2003, um, this guy, his name is Professor Richard Simpson. He was one of my um, PhD advisors. We call, you call him a Dr. Vata here in Deutschland. And Rick was a structural geologist like me. It's an, oil and gas is not our principal expertise, but it's one of the topics that we deal with. And Rick was also very good at um, speaking publicly about issues of importance related to geological resources and the planet. And when I started working with him, you can see that there's an article here published in um, 2003. And the um, article talked about this idea of peak oil. Um, and I'll just read through the, the excerpt that I've put here. Um, it says, put simply, across the earth, we're currently burning more than four barrels of oil for every new barrel discovered, while demand continues to rise. This was in 2003, 20 years ago. Independent analysts estimate we've produced nearly 50% of the total global resource of recoverable conventional oil. The global Hubbard peak for conventional oil production is predicted to occur in 2005, plus or minus five years, with the peak in gas production following shortly afterward. After the global peak, oil price will escalate steeply as demand exceeds supply. The Gulf states will no longer be able to meet the increased shortfall throughout the rest of the world. Competition for a dwindling oil supply will become increasingly fierce. The world's resource of conventional oil, accumulated over several hundred million years of geological time, will effectively be dissipated only 200 years after the first oil wells were drilled in the mid-19th century. It's a pretty freaky bit of text, right? So this, um, let me just explain this idea of peak oil just in graphical form for you. So this graph shows how many billion barrels of um, oil are actually extracted globally per year. And it's split up over um, different regions of the earth. You can see the USA there, Russia, Venezuela, the Middle East. Um, and this particular diagram suggests that we're actually going to have the peak of um, production of oil in 2010. This was actually in the past, right? So this graph comes from a few years ago. Um, and this concept of the peak is that, that we've basically reached the maximum extraction. And after this time, we're going to be starting to extract petroleum resources that are more difficult um, and more expensive. Um, and there'll be a point at some point in the um, right hand tail of this curve where the energy required to get more oil out of the earth is so high that we won't be able to use petroleum resources anymore. That's kind of, that's going to change the way that everybody is able to live because this is a really, really critical and really energy dense form of energy to drive our daily lives. Um, now, this was, as I said, the prediction for peak oil was that in 2005, plus or minus five years, the peak would be reached. As time has proceeded past that point, more petroleum reservoirs have been found globally. And the peak keeps moving. So if you read the literature nowadays, you know, five years later, people said, oh, the peak's going to occur in 2020. And we can take a look at the current statistics. Um, on the right is a graph coming um, from something known as the US Energy Information Administration. And this shows the liquid fuel supply and demand globally. Um, those are the two, the blue and the um, black curves. And you can see that the supply of what we're, at, we're actually pulling out of the ground at present seems to be keeping pace with the demand and it's not experiencing a fall to 
right? So we're still seeing a gradual increase in the amount of, of petroleum resources that we're able to extract from the earth. On the left at this point, I've just put in another graph to show you what proportion of the energy that we use on the globe comes from oil, coal, and natural gas, hydrocarbons. And um, the little, you can, so that's the orange, the brown, and the green. I want you to also see these other little um, types of energy up the top, nuclear, hydropower, biomass, and other renewable energy sources. And just look at the proportion of global energy that those currently produce. And the future projections, the end of the graphs at 2040, is that we will see a gradual increase in the amount of energy produced by these other sources, but that coal, oil, and natural gas will still substantially dominate our energy supply. I also I looked into the statistics um, of world oil production and Europe's oil production at present, and just, just out of interest, just to see exactly where we're getting with, with this concept of peak oil at present. You can see that actually we're still, um, this, this graph leads up to the modern day, 2020. We're still managing to gradually every year and extract a little bit more natural gas, a little bit more primary oil. But it seems like the crude oil, which is the, um, which is, yeah, the, the principal oil that we extract, that is um, gradually, in this graph, seems to be reducing. We've in the last couple of years, we just extracted a little bit less oil than we have in past years. And if you look at the European statistics, there's a definite reduction in the last 10 years in the amount of crude oil that has been extracted. So it's very dependent on where you look for your source of information, but it is quite possible to say that we have reached a point globally at this stage where we've extracted as much oil as we can from the earth, or we've, we've extracted We've had the peak, the Hubbard's peak, and in future, we do expect it to become increasingly difficult um, to find these petroleum resources. So I also, you know, I when I started my geological career with Rick Simpson, I was thinking about this peak oil concept all the time, and I was kind of a little nervous about the future for humanity, essentially. Um, because I, I recognize that it's not easy to make a transition to using other forms of energy when we've had this, um, this dependence on this cheap, easily available energy supply for, that's, that's fueling human development, right? And this actually has worried me through my whole career. But particularly, I was worried about this concept of of the oil peak and the fact that the hydrocarbon resources just wouldn't be available by 2020, maybe 2050. What is that implication for, for how we live our lives? About 10 years ago, I was lucky enough to be at a conference um, run by something known as the International Continental Scientific Drilling Program. Um, and that was in Potsdam in Germany. And I heard a presentation there by a professor, um, Professor Zoback, who's shown here in the top right. Um, Mark Zoback is professor of reservoir geomechanics at Stanford University in California. Um, he's pretty world famous in the field of reservoir geomechanics, is understanding the, the um, state of fluid pressure, the state of stress, and how that affects the ability to extract oil out of reservoirs under the earth. In fact, he ran one of these um, courses, they're called Massive Online Courses, right, MOOCs. Um, the reservoir geomechanics course that Mark Zoback ran, I think every year it had 13,000 people signing up to, to take that course, um, which is a pretty phenomenal number of people globally wanting to learn about how you how you deal with fractured rock and anyway um mark gave a talk at the conference i was at which was an eye-opener for me at the time because he talked to me about because he talked about non-conventional sources of hydrocarbons which was something i wasn't aware about of at the time um, and this is a graph actually showing 
the distribution of non-conventional oil deposits um, globally, a particular type of non-conventional oil known as oil shale. Um, I put a photo of me looking super surprised at this time with the light bulb because I kind of had a realization at that stage. I was previously thinking, hey, we're running out of hydrocarbons with time. And then I kind of realized that actually there's globally an awful lot of hydrocarbons. They're just much more difficult to get. But prior to that, I'd thought, hey, everyone's going to have to deal with this. We're going to have to make transitions to walking around, not driving our cars, having a horse and cart. There's going to be a big disastrous change that will stimulate humanity to have to change its, its practices. And when I understood about these other um, non-conventional oil deposits, I realized that maybe there was a lot of supply that would probably fuel us for the rest of my life and your life and et cetera to be able to keep using oil. Um, let me explain what oil shales and there's another type of deposit. So these things called oil shales and tar sands. Um, these are not as cool as traditional hydrocarbon resources. Um, oil shales is a photo of a rock that's an oil shale here. Um, this is a really fine mudstony type rock and it has an awful lot of um, hydrocarbons sort of bound into the rock, but it's really tightly contained in there. So it's not very easy to extract it. It's not sitting in the little pore spaces between the sandstone. If you drill a hole into an oil shale, you won't manage to just get hydrocarbons squirting to the surface. In order to extract oil from these rocks, you actually have to crush the rock up and heat it. And you can do that um, if you can bring the rock to the surface, you can do that at the surface. You generally have a natural permeability. The, the fluid, the hydrocarbons, won't easily flow through that reservoir into the surface. So quite often when they drill into them, they drill down, they drill sideways nowadays, and then they squirt fluids in there that create fractures, and that creates a higher permeability and allows the petroleum that's in that reservoir to easily get into the well and come to the surface, which is actually, from my perspective, a good thing. Because if you have one borehole that goes down to depth and gets most of the oil out, that's great. If you only get 10% of the oil out of that reservoir for that one hole, then you have to drill another hole, and that creates more mess at the surface. Not a good thing. Um, but fracking isn't necessary. So fracking is actually, I think, advantageous in terms of reducing the environmental destruction for most oil and gas extraction. Also, as a structural geologist, it's the only mechanism we have to make measurements of the state of stress or the pressure at depth in the earth. And that information is additionally important for people who are trying to understand processes like how earthquakes happen. So fracking is a, is a scientific method that can actually be used to our advantage. It's also really useful to be able to create additional permeability at depth when you're talking about a topic I'll address a bit later, which is geothermal resources. So fracking has a bad press, and it's a press associated with this idea of non-conventional hydrocarbons, um, but actually it's maybe not a bad process. It's an important point I'd like some of you to leave this lecture with. Okay, stepping forward. So I've talked all about these hydrocarbons and how you get them and where they're found. But now I need to bring the focus back to the topic of this lecture series, which is climate. So what are the climatic implications of using oil? I think that I mentioned previously that the extraction mechanism for, for getting hydrocarbons out of oil shales released a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and in fact, any of these hydrocarbon molecules that were previously stored at depth in the earth, if we bring them to the surface, and particularly if we burn them to generate energy, then we are going to release carbon dioxide into that atmosphere. And unequivocally, anthropogenic, that means human-induced increase in carbon dioxide in the global climate, is having an effect on climate. I'm not going to go into all of the... Um, reasons that this is demonstrably true. This is a topic that you would be better to address with many of my colleagues in Gaia Wissenschaften who do specific research into um, climatic evolution. But as a geoscientist, over the years I am completely convinced 
that the human increase in carbon dioxide is having a dramatic and adverse impact on global climate evolution. The biggest thing that we see as a consequence of increasing global CO2 is sea level rise. And also, I think um, we're seeing a lot more unstable climatic behaviours. Just out of interest, if you want to work out how much carbon dioxide is emitted by any of your current practices, you might want to click on these links, your CO2 footprint calculator or your CO2 emissions calculator. Um, I'm just going to talk about sea level rise. So this graph on the right shows you actually there has been gradual rise in sea level occurring since 1800. And yes, over Earth's history, sea level does fluctuate up and down. But uh, have a look at the graph in the 1900s. So early 1900s, mid 1900s, we're talking about the First and Second World War. Mm, you can see that there is a rather dramatic increase in this graph as sea level change. And that is really coincident with when the planet started to substantially use hydrocarbons and emit vast amounts of carbon dioxide that had previously been trapped in natural earth reservoirs. What about the future? You can see on this graph from 2000, or we're now 2020, there are a bit of a range in predictions of how much sea level might rise. Um, if you look at the statistics, the best source of information for sea level rise is um, publications from, from the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. And they will tell you that the conservative prediction is that sea level will be 22 to 44 centimetres higher than it was in the 1990s by the mid-2090s. That's the conservative estimate. There's a process that might um, cause a lot more change. So are you aware that this is a graph, uh, this is a map here of Antarctica. And most of the Antarctic continent is currently big glacial ice sheets. Now, it's possible for the ice shelves um, to melt. They might melt slowly. That would be, can, if that happens, they just gradually melt and ablate a little bit. We will have sea level rise of 22 to 44 centimetres. Instead, if we see collapse of these ice shelves, um, which might happen through seawater incursion through underneath the base of the ice shelf, for example, then the prediction, if the whole West Antarctic ice sheet collapsed, the prediction is that you'd see 4.3 metres of sea level rise. That's 10 times as much. And actually, just interestingly, right, in March okay. of this year, part of an ice shelf collapsed. These are satellite images showing the ice shelf Sorry. Um, on the East Antarctic ice shelf. Part of, part of the, the glacial ice mass there actually did break off quite a right, we large need to area. We need to kill the um, recorded me. 30 kilometres <laughs> square. Can you guys pause that? Um, guys, hi. My sincere apologies that my transport was delayed, and I am now here to continue the lecture in person. <laughs> hey, this is a great this is a great commentary on what we can do with the digital era, right? At least I had my backup plan in place. So I think I was at the point of ex of talking about sea level rise. Um, a comment I maybe didn't make when I recorded the lecture is. You know, I don't personally study sea level change myself, but I am I've spent a lot of time asking my colleagues who really do, that's their scientific expertise. Is it real? Is sea level rise actually happening because of human beings? Because actually the sea level has fluctuated over the last many thousands, millions of years of Earth history su substantially, and there's a potential that the sea level rise we're seeing now, people will say to you, oh, it's, it's just happening anyway because the sea level always changes. But actually the rate of change of sea level, since human beings have started to burn fossil fuels in the 1900s, you can see on that graph there that the rate of change has just exponentially increased. And that's a clear demonstration that sea level rise at the moment is anthropogenic. Okay, is that my advanced slides? And laser pointer, laser pointer, there you go. That's the point about at which we started to exploit hydrocarbons and release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 
Um, so yeah, the big um, elephant in the room with respect to sea level rise is indeed the potential breakdown of the Antarctic ice sheets. And if those collapse, which we, some climate predictions suggest they will, some suggest that they won't, but the worst case scenario is four and a half meters of sea level rise. That's a dramatic thing that we want to avoid, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, that's this. This photo is, okay, learning it. This photo here is actually um, Kolkata in India. So these people are a massive city of millions of people who live, it might not be 100% clear, but this is actually just water, standing water. That's, that's the ground level of the buildings and it's the water level in the, this is the Ganges Delta, right? Now, if they see 40 centimeters of sea level rise, there are going to be millions of people that don't have a place to live. If they see four and a half meters, we're in a really bad situation. Okay, so. Stupid picture number three. As I said in the recording, over my career, I've progressively come to realize Firstly, that potentially we're running out of hydrocarbons. Secondly, that there are lots of hydrocarbons, but they might be really hard to get, really expensive, and really environmentally detrimental. And thirdly, this is the other realization, if we continue to use those hydrocarbons, the impact on the climate is really too adverse to bear. So we need to find some alternative solutions. Okay. This is an interesting analysis that I think you'll be intrigued by. So I, you know, I, I don't come from Germany originally, I come from New Zealand. I liked moving to Germany because your country has been very inspiring to me in terms of the amount of energy that is produced already by renewable forms. Um, Rheinland Fels is doing pretty well too, so this is Germany as a whole the electricity that's produced in Germany, 40% of it is currently produced by renewable types mostly. That's um, solar by photovoltaic and wind turbines. rheinland Fels is even better than that. So great, great state to live in. 51% of your electricity is produced by renewable sources. Um, but I want to draw your attention to this other graph over here. This pie chart shows the three major groups of energy that are used in modern life. The, the blue is the electricity that powers your computer, that turns on your lights, that powers your refrigerator. The green is your transport energy. So how you get from your house to here. And the orange is heating and cooling, which is huge. So almost 50% of the energy that we consume is used to keep the climate at the right temperature. Now, this graph, this plot, the renewable, uh, sorry, the renewable energy that's produced, all of that fits within the blue on this graph. So most of this other energy is actually currently being produced using hydrocarbons. So actually we're not doing that well. Does that make sense? We need somehow in particular to find ways to either reduce our consumption of transport energy, which is feasible, or and also to replace some of our heating and cooling energy with renewable sources. So just to think about the types of alternative energies that are renewable, that, that are not going to require us to extract a resource from the earth that we can't replace in our lifetimes. Feasibly, we can look at nuclear energy, solar energy, tidal energy, wind, hydroelectric, or geothermal. Now, I can't talk about all of those today, but I do want to talk to you about geothermal energy in particular. Um, you might be interested in this analysis of the environmental cost of the different types of energy that we can use. So, Fossil fuels, the ones that, the petroleum resources here. Um, the analysis here is, if you look at the air pollution and the greenhouse gases emitted as you consume this type of fuel, this type, or generate this kind of energy, and you put a cost to it, that cost is applied basically 
if you wanted to buy carbon credits to offset something, you can apply that, that costing, right? And you can see that most of these um, fossil fuel energies are pretty expensive in terms of their environmental impact, their carbon dioxide emissions. The two types of energy that look really good on this plot are solar, so that's solar heating, essentially. Maybe the system where you get those flat pipes and put them on your roof and let all the water run through, yeah, okay. And deep geothermal energy. That's super cheap, right? So that's the one that we wanna be using. Um, both, so there's, there's two different types of geothermal energy. There's deep geothermal and shallow geothermal. Deep geothermal is traditional geothermal. It was actually developed really well in my own home country, New Zealand. There are places on the earth, and this I might not have said earlier in the lecture, as you go down in the ground from here, there is a gradual increase in temperature. It's about 25 degrees C per kilometer. So by the time you're at four kilometers depth, it's about 100 degrees C. It's pretty hard to work in the bottom of an African coal mine, right? Um, so geothermal relies on that principle. In a, in a deep geothermal power plant, you drill a big diameter borehole at some location where there is a high heat ge geothermal gradient. You put water into it, it circulates through the ground at depth, probably through a system of hydrofractures, which you've, have been generated to increase the ability of the water to flow through the rock. That's a good use for fracking. And then that is circulated back to the surface, and actually there's a big system of condensers and things that allow the heat energy to be extracted from the steam that comes from the ground. Shallow geothermal is a little bit different. Um, and shallow geothermal, we don't, it's not generally thought that it will be used to generally generate electricity through some conversion process. Instead, shallow geothermal is particularly useful for heating energy. Um, so there's a um, couple of really good publications that have come out in the last year and a half. These are shown up here, the roadmaps for deep geothermal energy and shallow geothermal energy in Deutschland. Um, and these are publications are recommendations for policymakers and scientists. Um, an industry on how we can make a transition to using more geothermal energy to, to heat Germany. So um, I just pulled out a few key points out of those two documents. Currently we actually do generate, sorry, I, I spoke inaccurately previously, 15% of this graph here is actually generated already by burning biomass or using solar thermal or geothermal but that up to 25% of our heating could actually be generated by geothermal methods. Total 70 gigawatts of energy. But it's going to cost 2 billion euros per gigawatt to set up the power plants to convert that energy. So that's a big investment that needs to be made, right? That's the deep geothermal. The recommendations out of the shallow geothermal roadmap are that if we had 12 million heat pumps and they would be geothermally linked heat pumps, which I'll explain in a second. By 2045, we would able, be able to reduce Germany's CO2 emissions to levels that accord with our commitment globally to reduce CO2 to prohibit climate change. Um, okay, let me explain a little more of the shallow geothermal. So you know a heat pump can heat or it can cool your house. And if you look at this graph here, this is actually the temperature with depth beneath the Rheingraben. So at the surface, you're aware that the temperature might fluctuate from zero degrees to plus 35 degrees this summer, right? But as soon as you go, it's about 12 meters underground, maximum of 15, you have a stable temperature. And the stable temperature in this plot is 10 degrees C. The, I've seen that there's a lot of monitoring networks through the Taunus, um, and I've heard that the stable temperature at depth under most of those is 14 degrees C, below a depth of about 15 meters. So the idea 
of this form of, ge of geothermal, shallow geothermal, is that you need to just drill a borehole to a depth of 20 meters next to a house. In winter, you can take your surface water, which is at zero degrees C, and you can put it into that borehole and allow it to warm up as it goes through the ground, rise back to the surface at 15 degrees. And it's going to be supplementary to any other form of heating in your house. Um, the opposite effect can be used in summer. So obviously the 14 degrees C is then cooler than the summer, right? So there's some component of energy. If you link that circulating fluid through to your heat pump, through a little converter, then your heat pump works much more efficiently and draws less electricity in order to cool or heat your home. Um, these sort of systems could be installed all over this region. They could be installed all over the planet. Everybody's house, when they go to install a new heat pump, could also be linked to a little ground sourced system. It turns out, studies show that even if you just have a, a little pipe that goes down to a depth of five meters outside your house, you get positive reduction in the, the actual electricity consumption to run your heat pump. Um, so, unfortunately, we can't just jump into using this immediately. Firstly, as I've already noted, it is expensive to invest in geothermal power plants. All of the infrastructure associated with exploiting geothermal potential in this region is going to cost some money to put in place. But I would adhere that we should at least be attempting to test it, right? Now, there, there, are, there is a little bit of um, societal pressure against doing this, and that's because there have been a few cases in this region in Europe where things associated with exploiting geothermal energy have not gone according to plan. One of the most famous cases for us is this, it's a town called Stauffen, it's down in the southern Rheingraben, yeah? Now this town actually decided to put in place their own ground source geothermal system. Awesome. Unfortunately, they didn't properly investigate the geological subsurface, and underneath the town there was a layer of a rock type called anhydrite. When you get that stuff wet, it swells up. So they put water into the ground under their town, and then unfortunately, the ground surface rose about 10, 20 centimeters in the middle of the city, and there are cracks through all of the old buildings, which is not a good thing to have. So you do need to carefully explore the subsurface geology before you start using these kinds of systems. But cool, let's just do that exploration. Um, Another case where there have been adverse implications of injecting water into the rock under the subsurface is when you do that, sometimes you make fractures happen. Remember I explained hydrofracking to, to create a fracture in rock? You inject fluid under pressure and it forces the rock apart into a fracture. Unfortunately, that fracturing process is the same process that is an earthquake. And if you make a big enough fracture, you might make an earthquake that's felt at, at the surface. But most of the fractures that are generated in those kinds of projects are really tiny. Most of the earthquakes that are generated are below feelable level. People in this country are not used to hearing any earthquakes happening. Where I come from in New Zealand, if someone said there was a magnitude three earthquake, we'd all be like, yeah, whatever. You won't feel any effect of that. It has no implication for your building, right? The biggest earthquakes that have been generated through um, fluid injection into underground reservoirs are magnitude four, which is sometimes just barely perceptible at the surface and still will probably have no impact on your buildings. Um, we also have sufficient knowledge of the strength of rock, of the stress state at depth, to be able to calculate whether or not you will actually generate seismicity. So it's possible to evaluate the safety of any potential geothermal site. We have the information in the scientific community. What we still need, actually, is the trust of people that we know how to do this. 
And actually, that brings me back to a critical point for this lecture, which is that it's really nice to be able to talk to all of you, because I think you're the future who are not just my geology students. You're not just going to go and calculate whether we'll create hydrofractures, but many of you are going to be involved in different fields, and you are going to be the people who can spread the real information about what fracking is, what science knows, what the geothermal potential is, into all these different fields, and maybe help us to, to generate the momentum to see this transition occur in Germany. And I like the chance to provide you with just that background information to underpin those decisions. Okay, um, getting close to the end of this actually. I just wanted to say that there is actually a bright future with respect to earth resources for the energy crisis. We have alternatives, we just have to trust the scientists to know what they're doing. We have to invest in the development and you guys need to help me to apply political pressure. Um, Another thing is we all probably have to change our own habits a little bit and live in a society where we have less energy overall. And the last statement there says think globally, and I would like to just conclude with one other really interesting side topic on this whole energy topic, which is um, one of the biggest problems with CO2 emissions on the planet isn't from Europe, and it isn't from, okay, one of the biggest problems that we face is that the developing world, countries in particular like China, are going through the kind of transition to big energy demands that we here in Europe went through in the mid-1900s. So China has a vast amount of energy that is generated by coal burning power plants, a lot more, a much larger proportion of their energy for a very huge population who are rapidly changing their habits to having cars, two per family, et cetera, which was not the case before. This is a problem, right? Okay, so there's actually an interesting solution. If those coal burning power plants were to transition to using natural gas, their CO2 emissions would halve. That natural gas would have to be provided to them by other countries. For example, in New Zealand, five years ago, we stopped drilling for new oil because people were concerned about the impact on the seabed. Potentially, a couple of these petroleum wells would damage the seafloor, right? They didn't want to see in their backyard a little bit of environmental damage, when actually what would have happened was they would extract a lot of, CO of natural gas that could then be used to help China to make the transition to a lower carbon dioxide emission situation. So to me, that's a global perspective on reducing, reducing climate impact of fossil fuels, is that we need to share the resources equally amongst all of the people who have demands for energy across the planet. Okay, that's actually everything I had to say. I've run over time, but I thank you for your attention. But there is now a question and discussion session, and I'm sure there's multiple questions that you have, some of which I might answer. So, Virginia, thank you very much for showing up almost in time. It was so much more pleasant to have you here in live than to have you on the screen. <laughs> Let's sit down and have wait for, we have the poll, and we get questions from the people in the audience and from the people remotely. Okay. So, thank you also for the rescue system of your movies. It was great. It was almost as good as your life, but your life was much nicer. Good. We are waiting for question to come in. Do we have the... To Timo? But we can st already start. You were talking about uh, burning biomass and, for example, wood pellets count as biomass. 
So this is not at all CO2 neutral. Or this is it's not CO2 neutral. So absolutely this is not. really not a, a, a perfect renewable it's, energy. It's not it's a something perfect renewable energy for sure. Uh, no, the definition of renewable actually is that you can replace it within our lifetimes, right? Yeah. So it's renewable, but it's not low carbon it's, emissions. It's not yeah. positive in sense of carbon emission. I agree. You you talked about the shallow geothermal and. This is just, for my opinion, this is just a stabilization system. In winter, you just heat. In summer, you just cool. Do you somehow affect the planet in taking away the energy from the surface into the material? I think you're just redistributing the, yeah, redistribu the heat, right? I mean, the, the Earth is continually still cooling down from 4.6 billion years ago when it was formed. And that's a source of energy that's free and available, and it's all that's going to happen to it if we don't move it around in terms of where it is at the surface, mm -hmm. is that it will dissipate to the atmosphere. And you were quite concerned about seismic activities which you might trigger with the deep geothermal activities. Is there no risk in the shallow geothermal if you just go 15 meters is no seismic to be expected yeah the the thing is that big earthquakes earthquakes yeah. of magnitude four and above but because as you go deeper uh, in the earth there's okay. more stuff sitting on top of you if you start an, if you start a fracture at four kilometers depth yeah. it's got lots of energy yeah. and it can travel a long yeah. distance and make a large earthquake if you start something at 15 meters depth, it will only travel for 15 meters depth. Yeah, okay. So it's a tiny, uh, the size of an earthquake is proportional to the size sure. of the fracture, yeah? So you were, you're not counting anything below three? If, it's it's unlikely to have any, any adverse impact. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any questions yeah, coming in from the audience? Okay, um, we've got quite a bit to cover. So I reckon we just jump to the questions that has the most likes, or the second most likes, should Germany, and especially Nordrhein-Westfalen, start fracking? It would be fine if they frack in controlled situations. This was one point I was trying to make. Fracking is bad when it's done in shallow reservoirs. So this case that's highlighted in Gaslands, that is a bad use of fracking. Almost everywhere else, it's actually a positive thing. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a really important thing for people to realize. It's got very bad press, but it really will increase our chances of getting... So it, it helps us to extract the maximum petroleum out from one borehole we've put into the ground. It might increase the proportion of oil you can get out of an existing petroleum reservoir by <clears throat> two or three times. Okay, sorry, that's going to then produce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which isn't great. Um, it can provide permeability to allow us to circulate geothermal waters. And from a structural geologist's perspective, it allows us to make measurements of stress so we can actually determine the earthquake potential of putting more fluid into the rock. I see the big advantage of this ge geothermal use of energy in the localization and in getting rid of all this global activity of transporting energy from here to there. But a part of Renatia Palatina, how many places in the world are really uh, that well? Uh, is, can we do it everywhere? To some extent. So it's better, I said that generally on Earth it goes up at 25 degrees C per yeah. kilometer with debt. That varies. Okay, there are places like the Rheingraben is characteristically a part of the Earth where the surface of the Earth is pulling apart. And so the heat flow and the thermal gradient is higher than other mm. places. So it's better here, but generally the very shallow geothermal works almost anywhere on the planet. In some way it will supplement your potential heating and cooling energy. Yeah. We have a very different question here which is highlighted with the most numbers of likes, which is what's your personal opinion of the use of nuclear power? <laughs> I think <he> <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Another thing about being a New Zealander is that my country refuses to have anything nuclear on its shores, right? And we are the nuclear-free country. But actually, I think that probably we do need to use nuclear energy. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. We just have to have really good ways to dispose of the waste. Um, I really do believe that right. nuclear and so I that's everyone has allowed their own personal opinion yeah. and I don't want to influence anyone, but I think that that's a better option than burning a lot of hydrocarbons. Yeah, that's we don't have a solution for fully, fully We right. have to have good repositories before yeah, we make the decision to install issue. nuclear power plants. We must be certain that they're good. Okay, so another thing is, um, if Germany starts to invest heavily in one energy, which one should it be? Geothermal. Okay. Absolutely. That was quite, Absolutely. quite an easy one to cover. And in fact, you can go, the amount of geothermal at the moment is 0.1% of our energy, and it can go up to 100 times that. Okay. Um, so I reckon we just jump, because we've already covered geothermal quite a bit. Um, and we've also covered fracking, so what's your take on the impact of the chemicals and the water that we basically put into the ground? Yeah, so fracking also has bad press because people say, oh, they put chemicals in, but you need to actually look at what the chemicals are. This is a, right, you guys are informed, potentially scientists, or a lot of the chemicals are, that are used even in drilling processes are similar to the chemicals that go into your water supply that you drink. Because in all the water that's flowing in the pipelines around the city, if you, it all has a little bit of sediment in it and it would settle out. And there are actually chemicals in the water that are called flocculating agents that just keep things in suspension so that they don't settle and fill up the pipes. They're benign, there's, there've been studies to see if there's any impact on the human, yeah, turn out not to be that bad. So, so yeah, and sorry, one other thing, a lot of the stuff that comes to the surface with fracking is just rock dust. So when you put fertilizer on a paddock, you're just putting rock dust on. Phosphate is, is rock dust, rock flour. Really have to look into whether the chemistry of the stuff that's going into that system is actually dangerous or if it's just, oh, it's a chemical, right? I like the burning water very much. It's just a bit crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, actually, is crazy. read into Gasland, there was already some linkage between the reservoirs. Mm -hmm. The fracking made it worse, but it was already a natural phenomenon too. I'm not trying to underplay anything here, right? I'm just trying to say don't panic unnecessarily about some things that, unless you've taken a look at the real underpinning science behind things. There is another question which is highly rated here in the poll. If we really invest into geothermal worldwide, does it truly not also affect somehow the climate? A climate change? In terms of warming and cooling? I think that's where the in question terms comes of from, right? Stabilizing on a, on a, on a mid level or something. I, I wouldn't expect it to have an impact on the same impact on global climate. Probably a positive one in terms of just reducing our CO2 load, actually. Do we destabilize the surface if we create several 10 to 50 meter deep boreholes in our cities? We surely do. We should take real account of situations like Stelfin and really explore the subsurface and think about how changing fluid pressures in any subsurface geological layer might have an impact before we do things. I, I always think that proper exploration is really important. So okay. Possible. Okay. So we've basically got loads of questions regarding geothermal energy, and the way I understood it, it was it basically is quite low in terms of its impact on our planet. So how come we don't really use it? Is it really just this sort of we just need to invest more money? Question. Now we're using hydrocarbons because they're there and we can, and it's easy and cheap compared to any other source fundamentally, and we have to invest in order to change that. That's, that's, to me, that's the biggest prohibition, the biggest thing stopping us using geothermal. Another question to this part where you were just in the video. 
at the beginning of the talk, you had some slides with the trend and development which came from 2008 to 2009. Are they still relevant? Do we have changed these diagrams in how the different, if different uh, choices of energy uh, have uh, distributed? Has there something happened within the last 10 years or not? I don't think so. I think that, you remember the peak oil slides. I think the yeah. peak's been moving, right? I think when I was first starting in my academic career and I saw that the peak oil was predicted to be only two years in the future in 2005. And I don't think that, I think that we have found better exploration methods and found more resources. So I don't, so I, I think that's the biggest change. We still recognize what we need in terms of future energy. And I would say the other change is probably people's acceptance of the fact we're having an anthropogenic effect on mm. climate so that the proportion of future energy that should be from low carbon or renewable sources has to increase. That would be the yeah. modifications to those graphs. There is another question here which is highly rated, which just concerns this irreversible rise of the sea level. Do we already cope with this, with it? Are uh, any countries already starting to do some protection, those which have the sufficient resources to do it? Or because it's shocking if we hear something like in case that the ice shelf uh, crashes and we have mm -hmm. four meters. I can say that I'm aware of such right development, but it's not something I've looked into. This is a topic that is outside of my current knowledge. I, the Netherlands has a lot of river boats. <laughs> <laughs> they can, can all move on. On an individual houseboats. basis, I've heard of people <laughs> worrying about this. But. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. Uh, one, I'm, I reckon we just cover a few more. Um, one is, you said society should trust science in geothermal technology. Is there a chance of political support, or already an energy company that is interested in investing? It's, I think it's a very complicated thing to make, to see who is responsible for making that transition happen. Whether it be a private company that would invest in building the power plant and take the risk that then they need to sell their power to a consumer versus a government deciding that they will provide stimuli funding to companies that want to develop that kind of energy. I, I would adhere that we probably need the latter. That's why Germany, one of the reasons Germany has so much solar voltaic is because the, the, there was government support for installing that in your homes in the past, right? Okay, another very interesting one we've got is, what are typical arguments made against geothermal energy and how should we answer them? Arguments against, there is this, fear of generating earthquakes, and that's the main argument I'm aware of. You, even geothermal has to be done sustainably. Some of the deep geothermal relies on existing groundwater resources. So I don't want to say it, but New Zealand, where I come from, was really one of the global countries to first develop a lot of deep geothermal energy, a huge amount, right? A lot of the development was done there. And it was done in a region where they tapped down and actually, they didn't pump water down, they, they drew fluid out of the ground that was already there. And the water that they were bringing to the surface had been resident in the ground for a thousand years. And it wasn't being replenished as quickly. So actually the geothermal region, when I grew up, in, I would visit this area called Rotorua and it had geysers and boiling mud pools. And over my lifetime I watched the number of boiling mud pools reduce. So they did, in this particular region, they did over-exploit a natural resource without thinking about the sustainability of it. it, it could, we could have problems like that if we don't think and design the systems appropriately. Which is a, lo <coughs> which is a local complication, but which has to compete with the global uh, dis destruction, so we have to somehow balance what we are doing. Exactly. Okay, 
Do we have a final question which fits? Because we all have the full screen full of fracking. And I don't <laughs> think we want to discuss so much about fracking because it's not the it's, point. It is actually, fracking is out of these topics. Some of yeah. them are, are my general knowledge. Fracking is the topic I teach the most hard, right? The students in here who've actually been through my geology classes know that I'll teach them how to make hydrofractures. And I have to be the one person that stands up on the planet and says it's not all bad. In fact, most of the times it's good because all I hear is people being afraid of something they don't know anything about. And that's a worry to me because it's stopping some stuff that could be really good. Okay, maybe we take this statement just as the final phrase. So, because we always have to stop in latest five minutes, so I thank everyone, the audience, for coming here. And we promise next time to have the speaker who is actually coming from Berlin, who is Dr. Gregor Hagedorn. To some of you, he might be well known. Um, first of all, before, before I introduce his talk, let's thank very, very much Virginia here for both presentations. That was, that was at least a surprise when you stepped in in the middle and it was a relief also. I really appreciate it. And the was a very nice, we always have something new. So we only have 15 SDGs and we have you coming in a little bit delayed. So thanks very much for coming. It's a pleasure. We see you next Monday, I hope. And we have Dr. Gregor Hagedorn from the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. And he will cover SDG 14 and 15. I think one of them is a stolen one. 14 is not there. 15 is there, I see it. And he will talk about something really as relevant as what we heard in the first two talks. Eine Welt ohne Artensterben. Wie könnte das gehen? Eine biologische Perspektive. Wir freuen uns, wenn Sie alle wieder kommen, entweder live oder durch Ihren Bildschirm. Vielen Dank fürs Erscheinen und bis nächsten Montag. <lacht>